Good morning and welcome to this Automation Academy Mastering the Machine webinar for the 20th of July 2024. Today's topic, I interview my twin brother, Frank Lamb, spelled P-H-R-A-N-C-L-A-M-M, a completely different type of individual than I am, even though we are twins. Hope you enjoy it. Good morning, folks. My name is Frank Lamb, and I am the host of the Mastering the Machine webinar uh, held by the Automation Academy and IO Central, sponsored by NTH University. This is the 76th Mastering the Machine webinar for the 20th of July, 2024. And today we are going to be talking to Frank Lamb, a different spelling than mine. He's actually my twin brother. Uh, you can see here that he does have a superpower. He can tilt towers. Uh, and there's some people down there in the lower right trying to hold the tower back up with their secret powers themselves. And they're not doing as good a job as Frank is physically pushing it over. What is the Automation Academy? The Automation Academy is a... Uh, training website that I put together about three years ago. And it's named after a document called the Mastering the Machine, Step-by-Step -step Guide to Planning, Machine Building, and Documenting. And it is downloadable on automationllc.com and the automationprimer.com websites. It contains training videos for Alan Bradley Siemens, Back Off, Omron. It's got some job assistance based on the Ken Coleman show lots of systems integration information, lots of downloadable documents, some software that you can download from Advanced AMI, HMI, and Omron and others. Uh, we do have a community with interest groups called IO Central. I'd like to see some more uh, participation on that. And that may happen because we're going to be adding somewhere around 50 to 80 at least members next week, and I'll be explaining why that is. And we do have these regular events, uh, Mastering the Machine webinars and other special events, uh, Zoom events, that sort of thing. And why did I put this together? Partially to illustrate the fact that it's not all just about PLC programming, even though I do have some PLC programming videos on the Automation Academy site, there are a lot of other things that need to be studied, uh, many of which I've put books out on in the past. And then I've taken all of those books and turned them into PDFs and made them available on the website. So if you were interested in any of that material, a lot of those books run for $65 down to about $40. And they're all on the website and you can download them in pieces in PDFs and they're not available as eBooks anywhere else. So uh, you can see here a little pyramid that I built, the building blocks of industrial automation. And it kind of shows where we start out in high school and things like that, uh, reading math, the basics, and then we work our way up. And if we are getting into industrial automation, we start learning a lot of these other topics. But without knowing the topics below them, it's really hard to move into the topics above them. So for instance, when I teach PLC classes around the country, I have to cover numbering systems because a lot of the maintenance people don't know those systems yet. Hexadecimal and BCD, things like that. Lots of other controls, techniques, sensors, all that, that sort of thing. So um, that's where all of this started. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce my twin brother, Frank Lamb. Welcome, Frank. So where did it all begin? Well, I was born in Oregon in 1960 and uh, moved to California with my uh, parent at the time. So my folks ended up splitting up uh, when I was about four years old which was not a good thing for a little kid. So I was pretty pretty disruptive in school. Uh, I went to a military academy in 1964 uh, and 65. I was four or five years old. And I was actually kicked out of that military academy, which uh, 
I, I'm not real proud of, but I remember someone telling me that my grandfather thought, well, this is funny because even they can't handle uh, Frank. So uh, anyway, my my dad kept us rather than my mom keeping us. And as a matter of fact, I never, uh, never saw my real mother again after 1964. So I don't remember her at all. Um, in any case, is here some kind of uh, pictures from, you know, my history. High school itself, which was Tucson, 1966 to 78, uh, was a very unpleasant experience for me. I did not graduate high school either. Uh, as a matter of fact, kicked out of the military academy and then expelled from first grade. Uh, really bad news there. But my dad remarried uh, in about 1968-69 to my stepmother, and they remained married until the end. And she was a very good influence on myself and my sister. Uh, but still, I was kind of a young troublemaker. Uh, like I said, didn't graduate high school. I would have graduated in 1978, but instead I went and got a GED, which was quite easy back then. Um, I moved to uh, California after that. And you can see here, 1978, 79, these were both pictures from Ventura, California, and had a whole variety of jobs. Uh, worked as a cook in a crazy kids asylum, uh, joined the CETA program, which was the California Electrical Training Apprenticeship Program. And I did learn some things there. Um, I learned that I didn't want to wire houses. Uh, they put me to work pretty much working over my head quite a bit of the time, uh, doing commercial wiring and things like that, wiring plugs around the house. Uh, wasn't really, I wouldn't say, learning electricity itself at that time. Um, but anyway, 1978, 1981, I lived in four different states. Uh, of course, Arizona, uh, California, moved to Washington State. I was there when when Mount St. Helens blew up, for instance, I lived in Lacey, Washington, only 40, 50 miles away, uh, had 30 plus jobs over that period of time. So it was uh, like, like to play music, played guitar. That's one of the reasons I didn't graduate high school. I used to bring my guitar all the time to uh, school, which is probably not a, a very good thing to do. Uh, joined the Air Force in 1981, very smart move. Um, they definitely taught me a trade, uh, electronics. That's where I got into that. The picture in the lower left there is what I would have looked like, I suppose, if I had stayed in for about, uh, let's see, 1981 to now would have been 40 plus years. So if I had stayed in for 40 plus years, I suppose that's what I would have looked like, except I would have been more than a staff sergeant, right? So you can see the four step, uh, stripes on my sleeve. So 1985, you might wonder why I got out for a, a year or so. Well, I had met my wife in Tokyo, Japan in uh, 1985, early 1985, when I was stationed there. And uh, I proposed to her after only knowing her for a month or two. And uh, I had been in a rock band in 1983 and 84. You can see I was a short haired guy over on the left here and the rest of the guys were all civilians and I was military. Um, but I decided that I wanted to be a rock star. So when my term finished in August, uh, I moved with the singer of the band, which is the guy on the right here in this lower picture to, uh, Pensacola, Florida. And my soon to be wife came out to visit me, uh, from Tokyo. She had never been out of the country uh, certainly not to the United States. And uh, before she went back to uh, settle her stuff and maybe decide if she really wanted to marry me, we went ahead and got married anyway. So uh, at that time, that was a very easy way to get her back in this country. Uh, now, I don't think it works quite that way. But I was married in 1985, of all things, on Halloween um, in Pensacola by my boss, who ran a... Uh, a, a company called Pensacola Automatic that serviced video games. So I fixed video games, repaired them, that sort of thing. Service pool tables. Learned quite a bit at that point. So it was another one of my kind of scattered jobs. In any case, uh, that's kind of where it all started. That was me until I got married. Uh, 
the band stuff kind of ended uh, because at that point I had two daughters. So I uh, had, had my first daughter in 1986. We were married, uh, like I said, Halloween 1985. And uh, she was born right at nine months later. So uh, during the time that my wife had gone back to Japan, she was pregnant and we didn't know it, of course. And uh, so I had, had one daughter in 1986, the other one in 1987, only 16 months later. So they grew up together. And you can see in this picture from 1997, uh, I'm the guy in the hat sitting right here. And then right next to me is a good friend of mine, John Geisler. He's still a good friend. And sitting in his lap is Yuki. Yuki at that time is the one that I'm holding in this picture. And then Mariko is the one sitting next to my wife over here on the left. And uh, they were about, I don't know, maybe nine and 10 at that time, something like that. This picture of my wife uh, is from 2008. So this is much more recent this was in japan we ate at a really good restaurant where you grill your own food i thought that was pretty cool uh, then we went to um, uh, uh, college i went to the university of tennessee after getting out of the air force in 1989 and became a nearly 30 year old freshman i turned 30 in 1990 and i was still a freshman and i worked on my electrical engineering degree for four years got out in 1993 my first job in Knoxville, Tennessee, I wanted to stay where I was at because my kids were growing up there and we had a house, that sort of thing. I, I went to work for a very small company called Stevenson Controls. Stevenson Controls was owned by John Stevenson, who was a uh, very, very experienced older guy, probably close to the age that I am now, and I'm 64 right now. Um, he taught me a lot about classical controls. He also had some lines that were really instru uh, instrumental in teaching me how things worked. He sold Eagle Signal, which at the time had uh, Eagle Signal PLCs, the EPTAC controllers, the Micro and 90 controller, which was considered fairly modern for 1994, programmed with DOS, but he had put some tutorials together. So that was my first uh, real exposure to PLCs. Even though I went to University of Tennessee for electrical engineering, majoring in controls, didn't mess with PLCs at all then because PLCs were very basic uh, comparatively. So I uh, worked for John for a couple of years. Um, it was a very small company and I wasn't making any commission, which for sales is very important. I did manage to help him double the size of his company and his, his company was about 20 years old at that point, helping double the size of it due to, due to kind of breaking some new ground and getting a lot more into helping customers build things. And I thought that was a really good key in helping people, um, uh, making people interested in buying things was helping them put systems together. So that's where I kind of started to develop my interest in possibly building systems for other people. Uh, so I left there in 1995 in search of a little better pay, went to work for Road and Electric. Uh, it was pretty bad timing as far as I took the remaining territories from a couple of salesmen and they split two sales uh, territories into three. I got pretty much the dregs and they were all far away. I was traveling uh, for sales meetings about 100 miles every month. Uh, for the sales meeting. And then my office was in Cleveland, Tennessee, which was about 70 miles away. That was not a very pleasant time in my history. And during that time, I decided to start my own company. So tell me about ACS. Yes, ACS, um, while I was at Roden Electric, I, I started it in my garage. Uh, like many small businesses start, and uh, started building control panels. Now, you can see some of the small control panels. This was not my garage. This was an office a little bit later, but uh, built small panels like this, right? We would uh, just, just get the cabinet and put lots of knockouts in it and things, mount everything on it. Sometimes I would get very small jobs where I would program them. 
1996 PLCs were still not super advanced. I mean, I suppose the uh, PLC fives and the uh, Siemens S7 400s were out there. I didn't know how to program Siemens yet at that point. I did know how to program Alan Bradley and got into some of the little micrologics uh, systems, would build small systems for people again. Uh, a lot of times I used my knowledge of sensors to do these some of these smaller jobs. Originally, we mostly concentrated on panels and controls and less than a year into owning um, starting that company in my garage, I met a guy named Tom Nall, and I was at Bertelkamp Automation. Bertelkamp Automation um, is still around, and they sold a little bit of motion control and, uh, uh, you know, extrusion, things like that. You see a machine built out of extrusion here. They sold that. Uh, they sold lots of little widgets and things, and at that time, they were putting together uh, panels for people, and I started building panels for them. And so I was in their office, which my office was very close to theirs. And I met Tom Nall and he had just started his own machine uh, building company and he called it Nall Automation Systems, which is where the acronym NAS came from. And uh, he said uh, he had he had left uh, international paper uh, and they had built, you know, small packaging machines for people. And the guy that was doing the controls for him still worked for international paper and was building his panels on the side in the evenings at night, things like that. Sometimes had a hard time getting the controls up and running. Uh, and so Tom would have to stay with him all evening and it was kind of driving him crazy. So he said, Hey, can you build, um, these panels instead of Tony, and can you program this stuff? And I said, sure, you know, little knowing what I was going to be getting into because my projects started getting larger, right? We started building bigger and bigger machines, uh, started doing a lot of vision systems. That was right around, I would say, 1997, 1998. It was right around when I learned uh, DVT. Uh, it was Dickerson Vision Technologies, which back then um, was an independent company and was eating Cognex's lunch. They were doing a really good job, very easy to use software. So we started doing a whole lot of vision systems. Uh, another couple of uh, companies that I was associated with at the time, this thing in the lower left in this picture is a, uh, this is a roll forming line. And you can see product coming off the end of the line and it would cut these stove handle pieces off. And I put together the control system for that because it was very, very old. It was almost all kind of mechanically oriented with some timers and things. And I put a PLC in there and you can see here an old panel view of 550. I believe this was with touchpad. There is a DTAM here. The DTAM controls the uh, servo part. It talked directly to the servo and had a little PLC inside of this cabinet here, uh, put that together for them and then duplicated this and put one in Mexico, which was a pretty, pretty fun job. Did a lot of press work for them. So I learned a lot about presses, just putting together systems where they would buy an old press, maybe from China, uh, Sutherland presses, things like that. And we would strip all the controls out, retool everything and, uh, create a new press system for this company, Mills Products, <clears throat> in Athens, Tennessee. This on the right is an example of an NAS machine from that time. This went into 10X in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, not too far from where I live right now. And uh, it was an inspection machine. It kind of had a conveyor that came through here, had a uh, has a very cool uh, picture. I have a close-up of this, but it's on my website. If you ever get a chance, you can browse in and check that out. And then, of course, this thing over here in the lower left. Uh, <laughs> this picture shows kind of what I looked like back then, and I had a kind of a side-parted comb-over uh, haircut and uh, was not really a very good look for me. But there's a picture of my family from back at that time in about 1998 or 1999. And I had this brilliant idea that I was gonna make t-shirts for the company, my first promotional idea, and uh, made my family all put a t-shirt on and then pose for this picture. 
And so my arm's sticking out there holding the backside of the T-shirt, which says no Amish automation, no Luddite machine company, right? That was the basic idea. We'll do a good job for you and, and build good machines. Um, now, at that time, I really wasn't heavily into machine building. I built small systems like this Mills Products thing. Uh, but Tom Nall built a lot of the bigger machines. And I started just building some small ones on my own. And then in 2002, I started building machines in earnest. So these pictures are all from my shop or the, from uh, plants that I put the machines into. Did a lot of gauging and machine vision, uh, material handling, some assembly machines, things like that, and grew the company to about uh, 15 employees uh, by the time we closed in 2006. I want to say when we closed, maybe there were 12 employees, something like that. But we did have up to 15 at some point. Had some turnover, obviously. On the low end, we would use uh, a lot of students from ITT Tech and things like that. And we were a small company. We probably couldn't pay as, as well as some of the bigger companies. So they'd work for us maybe while they were in school sometimes. And then they would move on uh, when they got better jobs for bigger companies, and things like that. But I like to think that we trained people really well. Uh, I, I made a bit of a mistake in partnering with somebody in, I would say, the end of 2005. And I partnered with somebody who was in sales and really kind of turned them loose. And they really did help me initially land a whole lot of orders, including the one on the right here. Uh, he helped me land that one. And you can see a vision inspection here, right? This is part of it. Uh, and then also uh, he landed this job. This job was for a company called Daikin, which is now called Exidy. And uh, it, it's a very sad story exactly how it happened, but I didn't know anything about uh, the sale really itself until he had already pretty much made the agreement and said, yeah, we can, we can do that. I mean, I think he did bring me some pictures and said, can you rebuild this machine? And I said, kind of sure. Yeah. Why not? Uh, we'll just, we'll just uh, build another one just like that and copy it. I said, make sure they have the drawings, make sure that they have uh, a program and things like that. And uh, so did a takeoff tried to figure out what all the parts would cost. Uh, a lot of the information I was provided didn't include the fact that the price was in, in yen, right, in Japanese, and we could convert it, but you still had to make sure you could get that part, and the parts were only available from Japan. This was a Japanese machine. So um, went out there, and the first big surprise I had was they said, yes, we have the drawings, but they're only on paper. We don't have the electronic files and they're in Japanese. Okay, well, that's tough. Well, hired a um, Chinese engineer who could read the, the kanji characters on the drawings. And I said, we're going to have to reproduce all of these drawings in CAD. And he went to work on that. But that was a pretty big delay. I had not counted on that when I quoted the time. I think we, we gave ourselves four to six months to build this. Uh, but... Anyway, I think we got the job somewhere around uh, October, November, maybe we got the PO. So it was due, I would say, by April. And by somewhere around February, I realized that this was going to cost a whole lot more than we had been. So uh, this is kind of reinforces some of the things that I tell people who are starting machine building companies. You can make money on nine jobs in a row, make decent money on it, and lose it all on your 10th job. And that's exactly what happened here. It wasn't our 10th job or anything, but uh, you know, nine out of 10 projects go great, but that one project that does not go great can eat your lunch. And that's exactly what happened here. So we got into this and we realized, uh, you know, some of the parts are just really hard to come, come by. We were importing them. We had a lot of very detailed stuff. I have some close-ups of this, but there were a whole lot of little just screws and things like that. That we had a, a machine shop at that time, an iron worker, a mill, a lathe, uh, welded. You know, we did a lot of welding, things like that. Uh, during that time, 
we lost our welder and I had to learn how to weld and finish a lot of this stuff up. Uh, I became a very good grinder. That's the way I put it. Um, so what not to do, you know, you definitely, when you bid a machine, you need to take everything into account. And this was the straw that broke the camel's back. I was extremely stressed by March of that year and decided to finish this machine out and then close the company, which was pretty heartbreaking at the time. Uh, I had done this for 10 years at this time, 1996 to 2006, went ahead and uh, found all of the employees' jobs. And I accepted a job with Wright Industries in June. And my wife stayed behind in Knoxville, which is about 150 miles from Wright Industries. And I went out and uh, they put me up in a kind of a um, temporary lodgings, you know, while I sold my house and we got rid of all the equipment in the company and uh, pretty much closed the doors and moved on. Uh, by, you know, September, my wife had moved out. Fortunately, timing wise, my daughters, uh, my oldest daughter had gone to college in 2004 as a, a gymnast at Oregon State. So she was already in school. And my youngest daughter was just about to go to college. Uh, she was in college by September of 2006 off in San Diego. So it was just myself and my wife. So that opened a new chapter. And uh, what I did after that is in 2006, again, went to work for Wright Industries, a very large at the time machine builder. Uh, and they did stuff with extrusion too, but they did a lot of welding and uh, pretty much anything you can think of. That company now is JR Automation. It's owned by JR Automation. So at the time, it was owned by a company called Dorfer. Um, these two machines, uh, one went to Korea. We also built a bunch of things for 3M in South Dakota. So got to take some trips out there. That is me uh, in the lower left there on this web line. And I'm sitting there programming and debugging and doing typical startup duties. Uh, this had a lot of telesonic welders. This was my project. So I got to go on all the runoffs of the welders, uh, all the runoffs of the packaging machinery that was at the end of this stuff. Uh, and we did all the inspections, had Cognex vision systems on it. It was a pretty, pretty cool project. Had a couple robots on the uh, filter, filter uh, inspection lines. Uh, so I learned a little bit of adept robot programming. Um, but anyway, very good experience, worked on uh, lots of different uh, projects at Wright Industries while I was there. This one went into ZF. It was not a totally pleasant experience. As a matter of fact, we went up there and we started with about, I don't know, 10 engineers or so working on different aspects of this. This was a duplicate of another line that had been, been built in Hungary. And it's another one of those things that I think... Uh, Right Industries accepted without knowing all the details of the system. And it, they found out later that the system in Hungary was not operating correctly. And uh, so there were lots of changes going on in Hungary and we were having to push those changes here. Uh, this was originally bid by a company called Fabricom out of France. They were the ones who built the system in Hungary and then the ZF company in the United States said, we need an American company that is working on this so that uh, we have support, right? And so uh, Fabricom basically said, uh, we will provide all the information to Wright Industries. And at that time, Dorfer was interested in possibly buying Fabricom, expanding into Europe. And during that, that uh, time, a court case arose. They started building a uh, a duplicate line in China before this line was even running. And Wright Industries uh, went after Fabricom because they said, you know, you guys provided this instructions, but you're not helping us put all this together. And all these changes are coming through and we're losing money on it. And then ZF uh, sued uh, probably Fiber Fabricom and Wright Industries. I really don't know the details of that because they weren't getting their product uh, at the correct timing and all that. So it was, you know, overall, that was not a totally pleasant experience. I was also the last engineer left up there 
uh, having to deal with a lot of the political issues. You know, before that, there was a project manager and there were some other people. Um, I was kind of lost in the mix. And then I was one of the last people standing. And so when things like the testing stations would start failing a lot of parts, I was kind of the guy they would come to and talk to. And then I would simply refer them, of course, to our headquarters down in Nashville. So this was up in uh, Florence, Kentucky. And I started getting soured a little bit on just always traveling. I was gone every week, pretty much uh, up there finishing this project uh, off. Had another project I didn't totally enjoy. Um, it was kind of an evaluation project for Kimberly Clark. And I got to know too much about some of the um, the bean counters and things like that. That wasn't totally pleasant. Then also did some government work, and uh, which involves a whole lot of clerical stuff. So I decided to leave uh, Wright Industries. During that time, uh, I started a blog. So I didn't even know what a blog was in 2006 when I got to Wright. By 2008, 2009, uh, internet was coming alive a little bit more and I found out what a blog was. And people were asking me a whole lot of questions about uh, you know, sensors and how to do mechanical stuff uh, I had built machines and the electrical guys at, at Wright would ask me mechanical stuff. The mechanical guys at Wright would ask me electrical stuff. And I decided to create a website uh, that had some of that information on it. And that's where the automation primer concept came from. The automation primer is still around, www.automationprimer.com. And uh, started that in, I want to say the end of 2010, early 2011. So uh, became pretty popular. I posted almost every day and it grew kind of organically. A lot of people started visiting it. I've got some, um, some articles from way back then that actually still rank number one if you Google something like, you know, how does a, proxim a proximity sensor versus Hall effect sensor? What is the difference? So interestingly, I'm going to be speaking on that this next Friday, and uh, that that will be one of the topics that comes up. But anyway, so that was the automation primer. Uh, my, my mother always says it's primer. It's actually pronounced primer, but I like primer. So that's what I call it, the automation primer. And decided to leave, of course, Wright Industries. Uh, I, I had given my notice in early 2011, and I had uh, the... I guess he was the engineering manager was kind of asking me, you know, you know, can you stick around until this is done? Can you stick around till that's done? Oh, we'd like to assign you a new project. Can you work on that for a while? And I was, uh, you know, finally I got to the end of 2011 and I said, I really, really am leaving at the end of this year. Um, I, I was very eager to restart what I was doing with automation consulting services. And I had the little triangular logo at the time. And I kind of, Started planning this in December or so, uh, automation consulting, got myself an office in uh, Nashville, uh, not too far from downtown. <clears throat> it was one of those little shared office spaces with a shared receptionist at the time. Came up with a new logo, came up with a new website. That's when the automationllc.com came about. And that's what I've been doing um, from then until now. Uh, for the first, I'd say, two years, the you know, 2012 and 2013, I did these jobs. So these were uh, contracting jobs through Automation NTH, which is the company that I still uh, now do two weeks a, a month uh, for. And uh, they would send me to places like Mid-South Machine, which is the picture's uh, in the upper left of this big yellow border, that is a uh, Mid-South job. Um, this in the lower left was another Mid-South job. The one in the upper right in the yellow border was an uh, ATC job, which was uh, automation tool. And automation NTH would contract their engineers to automation tool. So I, these are all stations that I got to program and work on. Uh, and then this in the lower center uh, was up in Indiana for Ivana Automation. So this kind of shows how contracting can sometimes work 
Automation NTH had a lot of good engineers. They would either contract engineers like me, or they had their own engineers, including the owner of the company at the time, uh, Brent Brent Mason, who recently retired as president at, at NTH. Um, but they had a whole lot of good engineers that they could send out on these jobs, uh, some of which came from Wright Industries. A lot of people around here have worked for Wright. Uh, so they would send us to these different places and it was still quite a bit of travel and I do enjoy travel. That's really uh, a fun thing to do for me. Um, so got to do that for a couple of years, but then right in there, I uh, started doing training uh, for a company called Automation Training out of Canada in about 2013. And uh, by 2014, 2015, that was most of what I was doing. I had left behind a lot of the uh, a lot of the contracting to automation in TH. I, I occasionally still did jobs, but during that time, early uh, 2013, 2014, I started teaching for them. I met automa uh, American Beverage Depot during that time and became kind of one of their important contract engineers. Uh, and then sort of by by now, I am their de facto design engineer that does all their improvements in the plant. And that's this picture that you see here with the time display inside of the pasteurizer room here. Uh, I help them upgrade a lot of this stuff and migrate things from old PLCs that were things like Slick 500s and DeviceNet into the new modern control logic systems uh, go from something that was er every machine was disconnected into a full-blown ignition system now. So really have had a good time working with American Beverage Depot. Uh, we've done some other presentations on ABD uh, on this, this webinar. Uh, during that time, I also built a training facility in about 20... 17, uh, late 2016, 2017, and started building this mini factory that you see here. And the general idea was I really wanted to teach my own classes um, as well as for automation training. And part of the reason was, like I said, 2014, 2015, I spent 37 weeks on the road one of those years. I want to say 2015. And uh, the reason that I know that let me see if I can find this here. We'll go way back in time here. And I have a calendar that I keep. This is kind of an interesting way to do things, kind of very strange. Let's see, that's 2019. We need to go way back. There we go. So this was this was kind of my travel schedule during that time period. So this was, a. Uh, you can see 2015, there's ABD and then it went to Orlando, ABD again. I don't even remember where this was, Houston, ABD, Chicago, Minnesota, drove there, started driving to a lot of places. Irving, Texas, don't remember what that was for. Um, Poseidon, ABD, this was all driving through Florida, Atlanta, Connecticut, Orlando, you can see, you get the point. So doing a whole lot of traveling at that time, that was Maryland, Lake Charles, Louisiana. And I drove to most of these places, uh, Florida, Texas, Boston, lots and lots of different places. So I've kept track of where I went for a long time. Uh, and these are, a lot of these are classes, probably mostly classes. Occasionally I do a small um, small job for integration or something. ABD was all integration. At that time, they'd put new tank lines in and things like that. And so a lot, a lot, a lot of traveling. And then, yeah, Trinidad, <laughs> went to Haiti, went to a lot of different places. And then probably somewhere around this time was when I put my new uh, company in. So this was where I, I started building this mini factory here for training and started holding classes in my own facility. And these students, for instance, were uh, the first or second class to ever use this mini factory. The two folks standing in the back here, they were automation NTH people. So this would have been the second class 
The first one was a guy named Sam, and Sam uh, programmed this by himself. He got to work on a lot of this. I've explained a little what this does before, you know, pick and place, dial table, vision inspection, had both an Allen Bradley and a Siemens controller on it, dual channel, e-stop circuit, all the things that you would need to program a very small line. So I was pretty proud of this machine. Uh, this was a Keyence vision system, and then there was a Cognex over here. So you could do a little piece of everything here. And then you can see some tools laying on it here where I was still working on it. Kept working on it, working on it, working on it. And then uh, during that time, well, another thing that happened, and this was a direct result of uh, the automation primer, was I got to publish a book in 2013. And that book was a lot of the content of automation primer. It had just general information about industrial automation, and I was encouraged to do that by my uh, youngest daughter, for instance, and some other people, and managed to land McGraw-Hill as a publisher. That was my first book. I learned a lot about publishing at that time and came out and started publishing my own books in 2019. Uh, before that, I also published another book through a what they call a vanity publisher called Author House. That was not a pleasant experience. It, it cost a lot, and I didn't have any, you know, a lot of control over it. I actually owned all the content, unlike this McGraw Hill book, which uh, they basically say you can use ten percent of the content uh, for your own purposes, but we retain rights to the book itself. They don't want you republishing it under some other name or something like that. So I started doing self-publishing and my first uh, self-published book was advanced PLC hardware and programming during that time. Uh, then I republished the one that I had done through the vanity publisher, which was PLC hardware and programming multi-platform. And as you can see, these three books uh, all have the NTHU logo on it. Uh, NTH University is a program within Automation NTH, where they train apprentices and interns and also let some of the classes go out to customers. Speaking of which, I taught one of those for the last two weeks remotely from Automation NTH here to customers in San Diego. We did remote training half day each. Uh, went quite well. Um, so another book that I put out was this Building and Wiring Your Trainer Kit. And this was in about 2018, when I came up with the idea uh, for some trainers, and I'll be showing you some of those. Uh, but I was interrupted in March the 3rd, 2020, by a tornado. So that morning, about one o'clock a.m., a tornado came through, started in Nashville, and basically followed Interstate 40 all the way to Cookville, Tennessee killed quite a few people, mostly in Cookville, uh, but also went through my town of Lebanon and went dead center through my office. So the path of that tornado, this was about, about ground zero for it. It took chairs from a, a bar that was over here and blew them right through my front window. And you can see here, there's all the front windows bashed in, even knocked down, can you believe it, cinder block walls. Um, never seen anything quite like that. These cinder block walls, interesting, are laying on top of a, a bandsaw and a lathe <laughs> that I had, you know, for fabrication of this system. So uh, this was a pretty, pretty violent tornado. It also even hit part of my house, but just blew a, a kind of a, a four by a, a two by six into my front door and uh, busted some glass and things like that. And a lot of debris blew right up into my front door, but you can see what happened to the mini factory. So here's the before picture, right? Kind of nice and got all these nice California closets, tables with the compressor underneath. And then the tornado turned it into that. And I was able to rescue some of the pieces from it, but lost uh, some other things due to some just moving things around during the tornado. So that was a pretty unpleasant experience. And then, of course, we all know what happened with COVID. And COVID was about two weeks later. After March 3rd, I was actually teaching a class up in Kentucky for automation training. 
it was supposed to happen at my place, but of course my place got blasted. So we decided to get a hotel up near the plant where most of the students were from, got a hotel up there and then COVID shut everything down while I was in training. Um, what did I do back then? I decided to grow a beard and uh, COVID out and get, get a slouch hat and look sloppy and made some videos. If you ever look on YouTube, you can see some of my old videos that were basically COVID area videos. Uh, so during that time, I also decided to go online quite a bit more. And that's where the Automation Academy was created in 2021. I would say we started concepting all that in maybe 2020 and released it by the beginning of 2021. And so now what am I doing? Uh, I'm back to having my own office. You can see some pictures uh, right here with all these trainers. These are the new designs of the trainers that I have. And I'm redesigning them yet again and working, partnering with a company up in Chicago right now. Uh, this is a workstation that I use uh, with my NTH setup, do some of my work here. And then I have another uh, workstation over here to the left. And you can see these two students uh, at my Mastering the Machine um, uh, workshop back this, this previous January. This was very cold, a lot of snow outside here. So this was all of us here. Uh, and that is Jose and Umberto from ABD. And we had a third, a third guy, but he wasn't in this picture. This is me, uh, you know, teaching a NTH class to external customers here. So things are good, you know, designing widgets, uh, widgets being uh, the, these little models and things that I've shown before, uh, Fisher Technique widgets and some of my own conveyors. I have a 3D printer now and I'm and really getting into some creativity, kind of inventing things. Uh, have a lot of Arduino and Raspberry Pi. Sometimes I, I have too much stuff to work on and don't get around to it. So it sits around for quite a while. And that would be true uh, of, of several of my projects. But the trainer project is proceeding, um, working with a company that has redesigned this frame. I thought this frame was pretty good, but it was hard to, hard to get all these plastic parts and hard to build uh, this extrusion piece right here. Uh, so we've been redesigning that. Uh, I think they're going to produce them rather than me. I am a one person company, so I have no uh, real easy way to make a whole lot of stuff, but expect some exciting things there uh, from the creation of some of these new models. Other than that, uh, personally, outside of work, uh, I still play music. Right. So I was in the band thing a long time ago. I've uh, been in four bands since I was in Nashville, mostly during the early part of while I was here from 2006 to about 2011. When I was at Wright Industries, it was a lot easier to play in bands. I think I played in one as recently as 2013, but then got into the traveling heavily for uh, training. And of course, that uh, took me on the road a lot. And, and if you're in a band, they don't really appreciate you being on the road uh, and missing practices, right? You need to be together and play on the weekends and things. So I do open mics. That's always a fun thing to go do. Uh, so you can see uh, an open mic there. I was, you know, despite it looking like I'm doing some kind of singer songwriter stuff, I'm pretty much still a rock guy. So I play uh, more rock songs in an acoustic setting. I did put out a CD in, let me see, 20, 2011, I think this came out, and I titled it appropriately Automatica, and it did okay. You can see my name there. So you might ask, uh, what? where does the strange name come from? Well, all the way back in high school, like a lot of kids, I started, you know, hey, I'm going to spell my name funny and, you know, uh, impress the girls or whatever you want to say. Uh, you know, I don't know that it impressed them or whatever, but I'd write it on some of my papers. I was playing music back then. So I'd say, well, you know, Frank Lamb spelled P-H-R-A-N-C is just my alter ego. Uh, that's that's the other me that, that didn't graduate high school. So uh, I kept that name in uh, 
1990s, when it came time to get my email address, I had, uh, let's see, it was frank.lam at yahoo.com, right? So kept that then. And then when I put my CD out, it was like, well, why not use that same name uh, instead of putting it out with my regular spelling, which is F-R-A-N-K-L-A-M-B, very standard name. Uh, let's see, what else? Family's doing great. I have uh, two daughters, of course. They're now mid to getting to late 30s. Their husbands are both turning 40 this year. Uh, this is Kyle in the front, and you can see Harlan all the way at the other end of the table. And then they each have two children, so I have four grandkids. Uh, it's hard to see them here. This is Winley in the back. This is Hayes, so they're the two that are now five years old. And then you can see a close up here of Riley and Adler. And they are my three year old grandkids. And here they're going at it just playing drums in my music room, music studio. So life is very, very good right now, despite bad things happening. Uh, still very much in love with my wife. This was us in Japan, Shirakawa Go, probably 2017 something like that. So uh, took a picture it is one of the most amazing places you could ever go. Um, close to Takayama, Japan. So had a wonderful time there. I did get certified in scuba diving uh, when I went to Central America for my uh, midlife crisis in 2012. So lots of fun. So another thing that I'm doing uh, as a matter of fact, next week, I am driving to Houston for OT Skatacon. So OT Skatacon is very cool, uh, put on by the Automation Ladies, sponsored by lots and lots of different companies. It's at the Phoenix Experience Center in Houston, Texas. It's on July 25th and 26th. I'm not sure if there are uh, tickets left. I really don't know. But if you go to eventcreate.com, EOT Skatacon, you can possibly still get tickets. I'm sure you can attend virtually, uh, which would mean basically seeing everything that's going on and probably paying a little less. Uh, this was a pretty interesting picture that uh, some of these folks are pretty good with the AI stuff and uh, Photoshop or paint or whatever they're doing here. They're better at it than I am. So they've taken all of us uh, that are speakers at this event and placed us into this drawing. And let me see, I am this guy back here. And this picture was obviously taken in a trade show, probably Automate. Uh, and I'm standing there and I'm pointing. Uh, yeah, who, who was I pointing at? I want to say uh, Jake, the automation millennial, was originally who I was pointing at. But here, this is Caleb Travis. And so they put Caleb next to me and I'm pointing at him. Uh, you can see all these folks standing in the back. They've just put heads on different things and fixed them up. These are the automation ladies. That's Allie G and Nikki. Nick, uh, Nikki and Allie are the big organizers for this. They're spending a lot of time. Automation ladies is uh, a group. As a matter of fact, automation ladies, right? There's, a, there's an automation ladies button. So awesome folks, and I'm really looking forward to meeting all these people this next Thursday and Friday. But anyway, that's kind of what's up with me. Uh, other spelling, Frank Lamb's twin brother, Frank Lamb. So we are together, Frank Lamb. Thank you for attending this webinar. Thank you, Frank. So when is the next webinar? Uh, the next webinar will probably be August 24th, but I reserve the right to change that date. That's a Saturday, and I don't know what I'm going to speak on yet, but I have a ton of things that I'm doing. Like I said, I'm working with that partner in Chicago and uh, uh, redesigning uh, some panels. I'm building two or three of those enclosures myself, two Allen Bradleys for my own use, uh, L18, 1769 L18 processors. And uh, I've gone to advanced HMI training. I mentioned that last week and uh, kind of taken up with Archie Moore a little bit 
on some possible projects involving some of these widgets that I like working on. I'm in the process of building some conveyor based stuff, but have some ideas for some small training robots uh, and, and maybe getting together with some people to put those together, which would be very valuable to myself in training, but also to a lot of my students, uh, learn some more of the hands-on stuff, be able to use a teach pen and make it move. And I don't care too much about how accurate it is on positioning because it's just for training. My main interest is in keeping the cost low. This company that I work with in Chicago, uh, it's a company called Genflex. They are also very, very interested in keeping costs of training equipment low. I've I've complained about this before that, you know, companies will spend lots of money on training equipment. They have companies like Amatrol, and they have 30 and 40,000 or more stations, but then you're in a, a room with, you know, only one person can really program that at a time and you can't teach it to a bunch of students and you can't move the stuff around. That's the other problem. It's very big and heavy. And so I'd love to see smaller training equipment and working with them and people like Archie Moore and maybe some of the folks at OT Skatercock. I'm going to get to network a lot speaking at this event. But looking forward to it, and uh, we will see you all next time.